Hi everyone, again, my name is Ana Jimenez and uh, today I'm here to moderate this talk. So we've got uh, great uh, speakers coming from really diverse backgrounds. I will let now to introduce themselves uh, in a while. But I also wanted to uh, start with the um, trying to set light into the OSPO term, right? So coming to the uh, initial point of OSPOs being this vehicle uh, to integrate open source as part of the organization IT infrastructure and also to collaborate with the open source community. Uh, so uh, having that said, I will uh, let maybe Jonas, you can start and then we go as in order for all the speakers. Thank you, Anna, for having us uh, here today. So I'm Jonas van Bogart. I'm leading uh, the off open source program office at Aliander. And Aliander is a grid operator in the Netherlands, so we manage and uh, develop energy networks and make sure that all Dutch households and companies uh, stay warm and have access to electricity at all times. Thank you. Uh, my name is Karl Rietveld. I work at the uh, open source program offices at the Dutch Tax and Cost Administration in the Netherlands. Yeah, my name is Cornelius, Cornelius Schumacher. I work for Debussy's Tell, the IT daughter of Deutsche Bahn, the German railway company. And my title there is Open Source Steward, but basically you can understand that as uh, something open source. Uh. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, so my name is Wolfgang Gehring. I'm FOSS Ambassador and OSPO Lead at Mercedes-Benz Tech Innovation, which is a 100% IT subsidiary of the Mercedes-Benz Group. Hi everyone, my name is Alexander Butzlaff. Um, my role description is Open Source Officer. I work with the German Bundesdruckerei. And in contrast to, for instance, Mercedes, um, we are probably not that much known uh, outside of Germany. So traditionally, we've been printing um, ID documents, passports, and so on for the German market. All right, thank you. So, well, we can see that there is a lot of diversity here, a lot of different sectors coming from the public sector, for companies. So I think like my first question will be, in your specific company or uh, sector, why forming the OSPO? Because, you know, there are not really like a standard way to build one. So I would like to hear some thoughts on your specific needs and, and challenges there. Should I start? I have the microphone. <laughs> okay, in our case, um, it's actually fairly easy. As I said, traditionally, we've been printing ID documents, passports, and so on and so forth. Um, also, like banknotes and stuff. Um, we've, maybe for 10 years or so, we've also um, executed uh, digitalization projects uh, for the German public government already. But uh, during, the, uh, during the pandemic, all of a sudden, uh, the German government noticed that digitalization might actually be a great thing because no one was able to, to, to get out of their homes anymore. Um, and this really gave us a push um, with regard to more and more digitalization projects that were executed in-house for public, uh, for, for especially for the federal ministries. Um, so with this, our software development department has grown drastically, um, and this, of course, brought up a whole lot of new questions. Um, not only how to use open source properly, but also um, how to uh, contribute to open source and publish open source properly, because all of a sudden, there also was um, the external pressure by our customers, by the ministries, to um, produce software that is inherently open source. So um, this was the reason why like, I don't know, two years ago, um, the head of our development department decided to actually finance dedicated open source roles. Um, whereas in the past, I don't know, maybe, maybe four or five years before that, several colleagues within our teams have been trying to push open source and push open source strategies within the company with little to no success. So it really was the external trigger for us that, um, Took, or that, that, that made it possible to actually build these roles and to staff these roles. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So um, Mercedes-Benz used to be a company that bent steel sheets in certain ways and then a nice car came out. Uh, and we still do that, but uh, these days 
uh, a car is not just a car anymore that's you know mechanically engineered. It is becoming more and more a data center on wheels. So with lots and lots of software inside, and with that, it just you know when you develop software, you can't develop software anymore these days without open source, obviously, and um, that means you should you should embrace open source in 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 a way that helps you avert risks and to do open source in a more uh, concentrated fashion. Yeah. So if you're not doing that in a centralized OSPO, that means you're inviting risks that you're not mitigating and you're also not making full use of the potential that open source has. You know, use, contribute back and publish open source yourself. And uh, that's why we uh, came to the conclusion we need an OSPO. And there are still companies out there who say, we're not doing open source. But that usually doesn't mean you're actually not doing open source. It just means you're in denial. And um, better you face the reality and have an OSPO that takes care of these things. Yeah, I think for us at Deutsche Bahn, it was a similar story. Um, our, our business is trains and not software. Uh, but with digital transformation, software, of course, is uh, everywhere. And um, I think for us, the reason to create this position to have some uh, more central management of open source to bring in good practices was more driven by necessity because uh, a foresighted group of people within the company actually understood that the software is everywhere. So we went beyond the denial stage and some people decided, okay, we need somebody uh, just to be able to manage uh, all the open source software we are, we are dealing with. And uh, now we are entering the stage where we can actually move forward to realizing all the potential which comes from that. But I guess that's for later questions. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well, at the uh, Dutch Tax Administration, we actually have a quite a large group of uh, developers. So uh, um, in the past, we've seen quite a, some uh, initiatives about creating a policy around open source. Um, they tried at some point they failed um, and in 2010 during the log4j issues we actually had the same um, yeah we had a need again to try and look how to fix this um, and therefore there came a need again to 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 create some sort of um, program office um, and yeah, we had some initiatives and they failed and they tried again to create a policy, but they didn't came to a conclusion to start executing it. So um, at some point, my colleagues said, well, let's create an open source program office, a bureau, which we call it internally, um, to actually f uh, focus around all the different needs, all the uh, different tools, for example, or uh, creating a policy which actually executes the creation also, not only the use of uh, open source software, but also the creation and actually uh, start doing contributions. So that's the focus we have. Um, and that's my focus uh, as a program office. So. It's great to hear a lot of similarities in the other panelists, because also at our organization, uh, we used to be really focused on the physical uh, entity networks, but more and more we realize uh, that we are becoming also a digital company. And um, for us, a particular trigger, and I think there can be many triggers, was that open source was also seen as one of the means uh, for more co-creation. Eh? So connecting with other organizations in the sector and collaborating on ways uh, to innovate together. And uh, especially that triggered for us the high level management attention to open source uh, and also the recognition that we needed a group of people in our organization to, to give structure and organizations, organization to our open source ambition and plans. And that was the main start uh, of the open source uh, program office at Aliander. Mm -hmm. Cool. So while starting the OSPO is like the first step, uh, I, I know like people um, around challenge a lot, like how to keep continuity 
to, to the OSPO itself. And here I think that this, uh, the maturity levels plays a really important role. So for instance, uh, Jonas, I know like um, in Aleander you have like different responsibilities. Like, I don't know, you can set light more into like the different responsibilities, the priorities and why, and maybe uh, the, the rest of the panelists can also share like some uh, similarities or different responsibilities that are happening on, on, your, on your organization. In my perspective, there are three main uh, responsibilities for the OSPO. Eh? One side, we as OSPO are responsible for uh, improving the ability of the organization to consume open source and doing it in a way that we address risk in regarding to cybersecurity, but also making sure we comply with open source licenses. Secondly, we also uh, focus on making upstream's contribution available. And that sounds simple, but can be quite complex, especially in an organization like ours, to make that possible, to make visible what the process is, to get approval for upstream con contributions, making it clear what the requirements are and who has to sign off on that. And the third part, which is, made, I would say, even the most complex thing is, how can you bring an internal project that has been developed internally to the open source space. Well, it's actually, it sounds quite the same as we're doing. Um, uh, I really focus on, uh, we are also focused on who is allowed to approve what um, in a public administration that can be a challenge. So who's actually the actual owner that can be a challenge at our um, site. Um, but actually sounds quite familiar. Yeah, so we do have the same challenges ahead. Um, <clears throat> I, I realize that sometimes it feels like I'm doing anything related to open source and it doesn't matter what. So if people find the term open source somewhere, it's in a contract or it shows up somewhere in, on a website and, and they want to know what, what, what is going on there, they, they start to look for somebody who can answer the questions. And we are set up in a way that then they find me or us um, as we are now, so Max is there in the audience who is uh, working with me. Um, and uh, th this, is, I think, is a very, very important part, the central point of contact. Um, and uh, then we have to figure out what actually we have to need and who we need. And uh, th this, sometimes it's technical questions, uh, often it's legal questions, sometimes it's um, social questions, uh, economic questions, and uh, bridging all these different needs and finding the right people and bringing them together, um, for, for me, that's one of, uh, one of the main tasks. And uh, we try to yeah, kind of centralize the open source experience, the open source uh, knowledge in a way which can be consumed by the company um, while working with all these stakeholders across the company to bring things together. Yeah, so supporting what you just said, you know, anything open source, they come to us. So, okay, that's one thing. But what we really try to do from an organizational point of view is to enable the company to become a fully FOSS savvy company that truly embraces all aspects of FOSS. And uh, so that comes, I guess, in with three aspects. The, the first one is make open source safe to consume and to contribute back from legal and governance point of view. Okay, make sure the organization knows the rules um, and to, to help shape the rules. So trainings, for example, you know, policy processes and so forth. The second is to enable FOSS by creating and helping uh, on from a technical point of view. So, I mean, it is an IT topic, right? So we need IT experts that, you know, help with platforms and, and help to make that happen from this point of view. And the third one is from a community point of view, you know, make sure there is a FOSS community in our organization to help foster the community, tell people about it, you know, and, and, and make, make it happen from the community point of view. Oh, you have a... I have a black one. I like it. You're special. <laughs> you're, you're just special, huh? Um, I guess from our point of view, um, it's a bit it's a bit of a mixture of what Cornelius and uh, Wolfgang just said. So um, we don't really have a formalized OSPO in this uh, with this regard. Just like you, like the two of you uh, told us, um, what we have is um, three full-time roles that are called open source officers. 
and um, all of us are situated within the development division of our company. So the whole topic of um, working with, on, and, publish, uh, and publishing open source software has been mainly driven by the uh, development uh, division. So um, our main task still is to more or less streamline how our development teams work with open source software mainly. So um, from, our, from, from my manager's point of view, so to say, uh, one of the most important things for him is that um, our developers use um, open source software in a safe and compliant way. Um, and this is our, our responsibility to, to make this happen in the organization. Um, but still, uh, for us, it's, it's a bit like Cornelius said, we are the face of open source within the organization. So all the other people from, I don't know, the um, innovations branch or the, our business units, they know that we are there and that we take care of open source stuff. So um, it's also in our responsibility to create a, an inner source program, for instance, to uh, create policies regarding the uh, contribution and publication of open source software. So. Um, I'm happy that we actually have these three full-time roles because um, this way we can more or less split um, uh, responsibilities. So we have one one uh, one colleague, hello Matthias, um, who is who is, who is, who is who more or less comes from the uh, technical point of view, who's been a developer himself. He takes care of everything that is open uh, that is inner source. Um, we have one colleague um, who is originally or who originally came from a um, a law perspective, so who, who's more or less a lawyer, and um, she takes care of most of the open source compliance checks we do. And I myself, since I'm the only one who is into all of, the, all of these political discussions, um, I'm up to uh, streamlining how we publish and contribute open source software. Can I ask a question too? Sure. So Alexander, at Bundesdruckerei, you guys print our passports, like German passport, yeah? yeah. So, when, when I get a new passport, does that mean next time it will have a disclaimer that says published under MIT license? <laughs> <laughs> That's confidential. <laughs> Just wondering. <laughs> Okay, uh, I also wanted to highlight the point of inner source because I, I keep hearing more OSPOs uh, becoming friends of the ISPO inner source from offices or in case they don't have an ISPO, like trying to um, connect with inner source and to bring this open source cultures that is so needed. Uh, so coming, so also I want to also to uh, think about the, the, the challenges because I, I keep hearing your, your responsibilities and for me it makes total sense and I think, yeah, this is critical. And maybe all the audience here might say the same, like, of course, all these responsibilities make total sense. But I also want to hear what are the challenges you're facing in your organization? Um, in, in, in particular, like this year, uh, are there like any any core uh, topic that you will say, oh yeah, this is this is critical, and I don't know what to do about that. <laughs> any thoughts on on this? Well, actually, um, we, we didn't call it inner source um, up till last year, probably, but we are already sharing our uh, project internally. Uh, for quite a long term time and um, seeing the benefits of that. Um, our organization is structured in a way that they're all different business units and they yeah, some sort of connect with each other and interact with each other. Um, but yes, they're all funded different, funded different. So they have the time and the space to do it different than their colleagues. So interoperability between the different connections, uh, between the different solutions is a challenge. Um, so we try to bridge the gap between the architecture and actually the execution. So also as an OSPO, I play a role in that to see, hey, there's a new question about the new project. Is there already a connection with the architecture? So we have two concerned architects within our team. Um, so I see a lot of similarities with you guys. Um, but it's one of the challenges we face actually this year and last year um, to see if the, the projects are uh, aware of that there are different projects that are actually doing the same, so can we connect them and cooperate? And from the perspective of an inner source culture, well, it's a culture thing, um, to make it open 
and start challenging them, hey, can you open source your own project internally and then open source your project externally? Yes, we're a public administration and that's a challenge for some time. Um, we're also the tax administration, so that's also a challenge. We don't want to be open about what we're doing, so that's a challenge. Uh, but by law, we need to, so um, it's a cultural thing, really, um, and we need to create a cultural change. Um, and it might take a couple of years. So, but having the the openness already, start talking about it, having discussion on it is already uh, that's a big plus. I, <clears throat> I think that mindset is also very important. But another aspect, which was really a challenge in our company, was that we saw uh, that it was more easy for our developers teams to take software, open source software that was published outside our company and reused internally, than it was to reuse some part of code that was made by a development team in another department. So one of the things uh, we work, worked on and, and uh, are working on is we wanted to make it as easy uh, to reuse uh, code from other teams uh, inside the company. So one of the things that really helped us in this challenge is to uh, change the principle that we only make code available when there are reasons to, to make all code available to all teams unless there's a reason from security or other perspective to do not so. And that was uh, one of the things that, that helped us in approving inner source. The next step is to improving the mindset, uh, uh, which is a really big challenge as well. Um. I would like to distinguish between kind of normal challenges. So inner source, for example, is a topic which for me comes quite natural. And this is a matter of talking to people, explaining it. But actually, it matches what, what we as a company in many areas want, uh, working in a more modern way, in an open way in some way. Um, but there are also these, these challenges which, which are more fundamental. And one of the biggest challenge I have is that, um, I mean, some of you might have used the train um, in, in the last couple of months. And, and you see, we have challenges which have noth noth nothing to do with uh, software. And where maybe open source can help a little bit to uh, change things to, to the better. But it's not at the top of the agenda. And I think that's right um, in, in this, this way. Um, so for, for me, one of the challenges is that um, we have to find ways how to really effectively and efficiently deal with open source in a way which doesn't create a lot of work. And um, open source license compliance, for example, is, is of course it's necessary and nobody debates that, but organizing that in a way that scales and doesn't lead to, to a situation where a team spends, uh, I don't know, half of their time with compliance things instead of developing solutions to make things better, that, that's really one, one of the huge challenges. And uh, this goes with um, that the open source community is huge and it's diverse and it's lacking sometimes the interfaces. So even if we want to do the right thing and we want to contribute and we want to uh, yeah, take our responsibility there, uh, just for practical reasons, it becomes very difficult. Uh, we can contribute to projects which are... Uh, uh, licensed under a standard open source license, but uh, as soon as we detect a CLA, we are back to this, okay, uh, we have to go to our lawyers and discuss it, and is it even possible to contribute, and if we do that for, I don't know, <clears throat> my estimation already is we use 100,000 different open source projects, we can't discuss 100,000 CLAs in our company. That just makes contributions impossible. So for us, it's uh, one of the challenges is really to find the ways how to scale that in a way which doesn't put a huge burden on our already uh, company, which already has a lot of other things to take care of. Yeah, uh, so what you guys said resonates very well with me as well. Um, and adding to that, so the CRA will be a challenge. I mean, it's it's brand new, basically, so we all have to figure out how to how to deal with it and what it actually means for companies. Yeah. Um, also, so at Mercedes, I think we are quite good at a lot of aspects of open source, but what we're not so good at yet is publishing our own stuff as open source. We have a few uh, projects that are quite nice and, and have a nice community as well, but we want to be active more in that regard. You know, publish our own stuff, 
or co-create with others and work on something together. So that's what we're working on, what's going to be on the agenda for this year and, and uh, well, the following years, I guess. You know, For example, software-defined vehicle working group within the Eclipse Foundation. That's a, a very good, promising co-creation project. And um, I, I think that's going to go uh, really well. I hope it's going to go really well. And we plan to contribute. OK, so um, basically, I can give a plus one to all of what we just heard. Um, if I boil it down, first, the main challenges this year will still be knowledge transfer on the one hand and adaptation on the other hand. So when it comes to knowledge trans transfer, this applies to um, both, for instance, how development teams share code within our organization via an inner source program, um, but also really blunt stuff like making people know how our processes look like and what they should do developing products. Um, on the other hand, adaptation uh, really mm, takes place with regard to, for instance, um, business models. We heard the keynote uh, tomorrow morning um, about open source business models. And of course, um, having our customers trigger us to produce and publish open source software so that we can actually make business with them um, challenges us to develop uh, open source business models. And this is something that will be heavily discussed uh, this year um, and yeah, will be quite interesting. Yep. All right, so I think we, uh, as, a, as a wrap up uh, final uh, topic, I, I would like to ask each of you, like what would you say, what would your best advice be to those people in this room or what's in us right now? Uh, if they want to start an OSPO, so if they want to initiate this integration or have ways to have this vehicle to integrate open source as part of their organization. Money, quite frankly. <laughs> make sure that you have a sponsor and make sure that you have a budget to actually um, employ people and um, take care of that people actually have time to invest into open source processes and policies. Yeah, okay, so adding to that, uh, obviously you need a sponsor. You need to convince the bosses that this is something you need and it's not optional, right? Uh, so that's one thing. And then when you have the go, get the right people together. Uh, get people together who are really uh, passionate about the topic, who really care and not just, oh, I have nothing else better to do. That's why I'm going there. No, and then wonderful thing, things are going to start happening. I, I would say um, use what is already out there. Uh, there's a lot of material. There are a lot of communities. There are a lot of people who have probably done what you uh, have to do already before. So use that. It's not that different usually. Um, and as a second part to that, I would add that uh, you have to play your organization or play it in a way that fits your organization because there are differences. And one thing I, for example, realized that this was, was a very smart move by the Open Chain uh, group to um, get an ISO standard because when I talk about ISO standards, suddenly I have people in the company who understand what I mean uh, uh, in contrast to talking about open source. So using these things in a way that actually is tailored to your organization, um, I think, there's a lot of material. If you use it, um, you will be successful. Yes, plus one also for you guys. So uh, it's hard. For you, it's even harder. Um, uh, what helped at our organization was focusing around specific projects. So having an insight, for example, we wanted to have an insight on what we're actually using as an organization. So SBOMs should be uh, a good focus. Um, but also, figuring out what kind of projects you're running or are there teams uh, really enthusiastic about open source uh, which you can um, elaborate on publishing for example so are the teams really involved with open source and are they willing to um, walk the extra mile to open source their own project after four really good advices it's hard to give a fifth advice uh, my advice would be to um, I would say that perfect is the enemy of good. So uh, there's many aspects. Eh? We talked about OSPOs and the responsibilities. But my advice would start from small. Find uh, the topic uh, that's most crucial 
for your organization at that moment and start from there. And yeah, you can take, uh, take your time and grow on the other aspects, but at least you have a starting point where you can start, build a team, and find the sponsorship in your organization. Indeed. Um, I think it's fascinating to uh, ask uh, to across all different sectors, and, and you, the, the, there are so many diversity, but at the same time find, uh, through this conversation, all these common points that you all share. Of course, there are some differences, but there are also similarities. And I really want to encourage to keep these conversations, because I think this is where uh, people realize that there are common points uh, that OSPOs are struggling, and no matter uh, the sector they're coming from. And it's important to raise voice and to speak in, 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 a, in the public sphere and in a neutral sphere as well. So saying that, I think uh, we have some time for questions. Yes, I yes. hope there are people that are willing to ask something to our panelists. Anything? Okay. Uh, I, I think we have people from Holland and Germany on stage. Uh, do you see, do your governments have an open source strategy? Is that helping you or is that getting in the way or neutral? I would like to answer first. Uh, no. <laughs> um, officially, yes. There are certain guidelines and stuff that say um, that um, the federal government, at least in Germany, wants to uh, push open source software. Uh, when it comes to the, for instance, coalition contract of the current government, there is like half a sentence about open source software. Um, and this is really what we experience when we talk to our customers. Like, for instance, they, they, they address us and, and, and tell us, like, I don't know, die um, Bundesdruckerei, please produce software X, XYZ, and it has to be an open source software. And then you play back these questions like, why? What do you want to do with it? We don't know, but it's in the coalition contract. So this is currently, from my personal point of view, the state of open source in public administration in Germany, at least. Sounds a bit like Switzerland. I was lucky that to have to do an open source project funded by the Swiss Federal Chancellery, this was back in 1999, where they didn't know what that was yet. So actually, uh, but there, but oh, there, uh, oh, sorry. I want to reply from the Dutch. Uh, we have a law actually, uh, the law of open government. So it's actually helping at some point, but also has a lot of questions in it. Um, it says, so, uh, it explains the what, um, but not, it doesn't explain anything on the how, so it raises again a lot of questions on how to actually use, contribute and publish your own project or use, proper use your project. So um, that's a challenge, but yes, it's in our law. Um, uh, at some point it helps. Um, so it helps explaining in our organization throughout the different roles why we should start uh, looking at open source and why we should publish our own projects to be open, to um, um, answer the law. Um, but also there's a catch, uh, which you can do a request based on the law, which um, actually asks, publish your uh, um, project um, without looking into the details what would actually help of opening the project. So yes and no. Um, Still a lot of challenges in there, but it's a step. It's a big step, but yes. Yeah, so uh, I think governments in general are lagging behind a bit. <laughs> um, but I am seeing a lot of initiatives coming from various government organizations in Germany that are trying to help and, and push open source forward. You know, so there's this one that's called, that co what comes to my mind is GovTech Campus in, in Berlin. Uh, then there is the uh, sovereign tech fund that supports open source software uh, financially. And then uh, in, we're just talking to the state of Baden-Württemberg about open source, driving it forward. So, so I think we're seeing more and more of initiatives like that, hopefully helping open source. So. Thank you. Anybody else? A short question about the presentation that we saw this morning. If you think about such steward uh, ownership models, uh, well, I understand that open source project would trust them. Well, like we heard this morning, 
would you trust such companies from a company perspective? Um, I believe there's a lot of value in open source Jewish uh, foundations. Uh, especially in, in the few of our projects we open sourced uh, from, from Aliander. Uh, we now host under the Linux Foundation uh, as, as, uh, to really show the projects, but uh, also provide the projects with open governance, uh, showing that it's not only us behind it, but also uh, for the long run, making sure the project can continue being an open source project and have an open source governance around it. And that shows confidence for other organizations who step in those projects. And the similar applies also for the projects we up, contribute upstream. Having those projects under an open source foundation uh, builds trust. So I believe that there is a lot of potential uh, for open source foundation and stewards. Um, I, I think actually the, the steward ownership um, is, is a fantastic model which, which would create a lot of trust. Um, my, one of my biggest headaches is um, actually not uh, license compliance in general because we all know how to do that, it's work, um, but companies changing li licenses. And uh, this is happening um, as exactly in these scenarios we heard about this morning, venture capital funded companies starting with open source and then later yeah, restricting their, their openness in, in a way which uh, forces them to change the license. And uh, steward ownership um, <clears throat> based company would uh, not be able or would probably would be able to do that, but there would be no incentive to do that. So selecting open source projects, not only based on their license or not only based on technical reasons, but also uh, based on how sustainable the project is, is one, one of the big challenges we, we have to solve. And a foundation is one way to do that. We know that if it's a big foundation, we know the rules, how they play, and there are certain guardrails in place. Um, with companies, it comes down to, do you trust the company? And if there are guardrails which make sure a company can't be sold, um, that, that's actually something which, at least in my point of view, would um, yeah, increase the trust quite, quite a bit compared to a random other company. Okay, any other questions from the audience? Hi, and thank you very much first for this very interesting talk so far. Uh, I was wondering uh, does community management play a role in your OSPO that you're working in? If yes, uh, how important is it, like, acknowledged in your in your uh, institution? And if not, why not? Uh, so for us, community management is very important uh, because you know. So engineers are usually very good at you know, creating software, but they're not usually very good at engaging with the community because a lot of times they have the belief, hey, my software is good, and people will find out about it automatically and it will spread. And, and that is just not the case, right? So you need effective community management to help with that. Obviously, you know, without a project, you don't need to do community management, but um, without community management, it's not happening. So for us, it's very important. We have, we have a few people that we hired for this purpose. Yeah. Um, I would like to add to this. Um, in our case, um, community management is also important when it comes to uh, customers approaching us to produce certain software. Um, one, of the one of the first things to ask is always is who is responsible for community management? Either it's a customer or, for instance, a Sprint Agentur as, as, as one other organization besides uh, those you just named um, or whoever. Um, if it comes to us, so if the responsibility uh, is if the responsibility is with us, then of course we have to make sure that uh, people who do community management are properly funded. So yeah, especially with the business perspective, it's quite an important topic. Awesome. As a community manager, I really love this last question. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, thanks very much for that. <laughs>